Okay, my note's ready. So uh, part of the theme this year is Pearl, the next generation, and uh, what will the next generation of Pearl people look like? And before I can answer that, I think we first have to answer this. What do we want them to look like? And before we can answer that, we have to know what we look like right now. So, and why? So we're gonna take a little poll. So first off, please, everybody that can stand, please stand up, and if you can't stand up, just, just raise your hand. A little exercise in the morning. Oh, God. Yeah, I've got to stand here for 45 minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is, this is our, our control. Everybody that's going to stand up, stand up. Look like everybody stand, uh, stand, stand up. Good. Um, so uh, if anyone wants to take a picture, do it right now. Um, now, I'd like everybody who does not identify as a guy to sit down or put your hand down. And if, if there's any question, your choice. <laughs> Seriously. Um, all right, now look around. This is the question I want to ask you is, why is this room overwhelmingly full of guys? <laughs> why, why are there, I can make a bet that there probably are more Michaels here than women. <laughs> it's, it's funny, but it's also very sad. Um, all right, uh, thanks, have a seat. So how can we talk about the next generation uh, when this room looks more like my dad's generation? <laughs> so Pearl is, and open source in general, is overwhelmingly full of guys. And why is that? And you might think, well, maybe just computing is in general dominated by guys. Or maybe that we're just better at math or something, because you know, Pearl programming involves a whole lot of math, right? <laughs> Um, or, and basically that we're just reflecting a larger problem that's out of our control, but it turns out it's not true. Um, there's been some uh, fantastic data on this from an organization called Floss Polls. Commercial software is about 28% female. Uh, open source is somewhere between two and six, uh, pretty consistently. So what the hell? And we could talk all day about the exact numbers, and I really don't want to do that right now. We'd just be arguing about whether it's merely terrible or truly appalling. Uh, but no matter how you feel about the topic, there is one conclusion you can draw from this without argument or judgment, which is quite simply that open source is doing something to lose women. And like it or not, we have to face that and decide what we're going to do about it. But honestly, this isn't really about women. This, and the problem isn't how do we get more women, or it's not even why are there so, so many men. <laughs> the problem is why are we so damn homogenous? <laughs> and despite knowing that there is a problem, I didn't think you people would be so chipper in the morning <laughs> for laughing at my jokes. Uh, and being so concerned about it, we remained homogenous. Now I came into Pearl in 1995. I can't do math right now, but that was a while ago. Uh, and we look basically the same as we did then, maybe a little worse. Um, there's more of us, but basically uh, made up of the same type of people. Uh, and there's so many other points of diversity that I could go on about besides gender, talk about race, language, time zone, uh, physical ability, economics, education, culture, and so on. Uh, but quite honestly, gender is so damn obvious that that's what I'm going to use, and I only have 45 minutes. Um, so apologies if, you know, not covering all the axes here, there's a lot of them. So if Pearl and open source have one thing in common, it's their belief in the meritocracy. Uh, uh, the, the idea that you should be judged based on your merits, your code, and your contributions, not on how much money you have or, or say, your gender or whatever else. It's all about the code, your contributions, your work, and so on and so forth. Um, if we had a healthy meritocracy, this room would be about 28% women matching commercial IT, and I'd be talking about something else. Uh, if we had a healthy meritocracy, we'd have 28% female speakers. Uh, I, I had to do some guessing on the gender, so I apologize if I got anybody wrong. Um, if this were a healthy meritocracy, we would have had at least one female pumpkin by now. Uh, and it really pains me to say this, but our meritocracy is broken. <laughs> 
And like I said, this isn't really about women. This is about us. This is about uh, uh, demographic, dem demographic diversity is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, it, gender is simply easy to track. Uh, it's the most obvious thing in front of our face. If gender is out of whack, if demographic diversity is out of whack, uh, then there's a good chance that other things are as well. And have we optimized ourselves for thick-skinned male library developers? <laughs> and even more beyond that, uh, if we're doing something to drive away women, who else are we driving away? Uh, what other sorts of people, what ideas are we losing, and what viewpoints and skills? Uh, so who do we tend to have trouble finding in the pro community, and what skills are underrepresented? Uh, tech writers, mobile developers, Windows users. Uh, yeah, how often do you, you need to fix something on Windows and you can't find anybody? Um, grant writers, interface designers, community managers, GUI developers, uh, new programmers, new to Perl programmers, conference organizers, uh, graphic designers, teachers, trainers. Um, my list is cut off at the bottom. <laughs> Uh, young folks, old folks, uh, marketing people, business people, all of these skills are needed for a healthy language community. And when I talk about growing the pro community, I don't mean just more of the same. Uh, I mean different kinds of people. Uh, different ideas, different thoughts, different viewpoints. So we can adapt and change and grow and be healthy as the world around us and technology changes. If we don't change with it, we may just get left behind. So I don't want to turn this into a finger-pointing guilt fest, because I know when I was kind of struck with all this uh, many moons ago, I you know, felt the weight of you know, white male privilege coming down on me. Um, or you know, not weight, but shouldn't go off script. Um, <laughs> so, so I believe that the people in this community are overwhelmingly good people. Uh, and I view it as something like this. Uh, we have a small chunk of, of loudmouth assholes. Uh, and a vast majority are good people who just kind of want to be left alone to code and not think about this stuff. And then a small chunk uh, who do want to think about this stuff. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that they, the people in the middle sometimes are a little loud um, about how much they don't want to think about this stuff. And the problem is that, not that we're bad people or that we do awful things. The problem is we're so damn alike. It comes back to homogeny. At 95% in the middle, that's primarily male library developers and system um, who are thick-skinned, socially <laughs> passive, and don't want to hear about community issues. So I'm glad this is going. So homogeny breeds more homogeny. It's inbreeding. Uh, and unless you do something about it, uh, it, it just doesn't go away. So it's perfectly natural to want to make a community that you're comfortable in, uh, uh, one that works for you and your friends. But if your friends are all like you, uh, and if the same things make them comfortable and uncomfortable, if, you all, if they all want the same things, then you're going to optimize the community for them. Uh, if you, uh, the more you optimize for you and your friends and people like you, the less it will work for people on the fringes. And they will start to leave, and they will start to not, and then they will not come back. Uh, it's very easy to put your head down and just write code and not notice uh, that their voices, opinions, and ideas will get quieter and quieter. Individuals will come and be made uncomfortable and leave, and without being able to build up enough people to make themselves heard. Until one day, there's more Michaels than women, and we're all just agreeing with each other while the rest of the world moves on and forgets about us. And that is why I think this room is full of white guys. <laughs> um, so the women are sick of trying to tell us this. Uh, and it's about time the guys started dealing with their own crap. So, and I'm sick of the situation after 17 years in Pearl. Uh, and I'm sick of seeing my friends leave or be immediately turned off. Uh, I'm sick of seeing people told they just have to deal with it. Or if they don't like it, they should go start their own group. Uh, well, I am really not the best person for the job. And I've honestly been freaking out about this keynote for months. And I'm really glad you were laughing. Uh, and I'm not the first person to come up with anything that I'm going to tell you. Uh, but 
I was given the keynote spot, and this is all too important to ignore. And there are so many things I want to talk with you about about this subject, systematic discrimination and privilege being two huge issues I unfortunately won't be covering because um, I don't have time to do them right. So I'm going to do the best I can to get the most of you I can thinking about the problem and deciding if you want to solve it and how you're going to solve it. Because you are smart people, you're good people, and you're very good at solving problems. But once you understand it's a problem and once you decide it's worth solving. So I'm also going to cover some solutions. I'm not just going to berate you all day. Uh, and solutions that we can do as a group and that we do as, as individuals. In order to do that, first I have to bring up a really touchy topic. One that you probably have very strong feelings about. And it right divide the community just by bringing it up. I'm, of course, referring to Starship Captains. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a little, another little poll. And I probably you don't have to stand up this time. Uh, raise your hand. If you can raise your hand. You can vote more than once. You can raise your hand more than once. Uh, raise your hand for Kirk. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, Picard. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. OK, excellent. That's a good, good sign. Uh, Cisco. Okay, less for Cisco. Uh, and Janeway. Okay, and uh, finally, Porthos. <laughs> <laughs> we know who's really running that ship. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, let's talk about the two most iconic captains, Kirk and Picard. Two very different starship captains, 25 years apart, each for a different generation. Captain Kirk from the original 60s TV show. What does Kirk do in the crisis? Kirk, Kirk takes action. Kirk gives orders. Kirk is decisive. Kirk beam down, beams down to the planet. Kirk punches the alien. Kirk kisses the girl. Kirk, 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 Kirk. It's all about Kirk. Maybe he talks to his two best buddies. <laughs> but it's all about Kirk. And that's great for Kirk and Kirk's buddies. <laughs> now, Captain Picard from the early 90s Star Trek Next Generation. What does Picard do in a crisis? Picard holds a meeting. <laughs> Picard gathers his senior staff and he gets their opinions. Worf wants to fight it. Geordi wants to study it. Uh, Beverly wants to know if it's hurt. Riker wants to have sex with it. Troy wants to know how you feel about it. And Data feels bad because he doesn't have feelings. So Picard listens to all their different viewpoints. And only then, does he, only then does he make an informed decision. Now, Picard was given a huge job. And it was not the Enterprise D. Picard's job was following 20 years of Kirk, following 20 years of the same thing. Uh, 20 years of one captain, 20 years of one way to do it. The Next Generation brought in all this change. I forget, how many people watched it, watched Next Generation when it first came on the air? Okay, good, a good number. Um, so you remember like, oh my god, the bridge looks like the lobby of a Hilton hotel. <laughs> they have interstellar HR. <laughs> Picard surrenders the Enterprise in the first episode. Uh, why, can't, why can't the captain just shoot the bad guys and kiss the green women? Seriously. Well, it, it's all different and complicated, and that was the point. 20 years went by, and the world was different. Things were different and complicated, but also better. Picard updated Star Trek for a new generation, uh, and Picard introduced Star Trek to a wider audience. Um, come to think of it, uh, Larry, how old is Pearl? Uh, 20, 25 years old? OK, just checking. Um, no, no reason. So, <laughs> Kirk, Kirk gave us three seasons, and Kirk kicked that all off, and that we wouldn't be here without Kirk. Um, Picard, Picard gave us seven seasons and kicked off two more shows with 14 more. So, there you go. Uh, 
good segue to uh, talking about why I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the finest tradition of uh, Larry's keynotes, I'm going to talk about my eyes. Uh, so now I'm getting old, you get to hear about the medical issues. Um, uh, a couple months ago, I went to get my eyes checked. Uh, the wonderful American healthcare system um, this hadn't happened in a while, and I found out I have a blind spot. Uh, I lost some of my field of view in my left eye to uh, pigmentary glaucoma. Now, interestingly enough, uh, um, I can't see the blind spot even after it's been pointed out. It's kind of weird, right? Um, I can't even like trick myself into seeing it. it doesn't it doesn't work? Um, my brain tricks me into thinking it's just not there. And if my doctor hadn't pointed it out, I never would have known. And I would have ine inevitably lost all sight in my left eye irreversibly. Now, I can keep it from getting worse with some eye drops. So once it's pointed out and once I know about it, even though I can't see it, I believe what my doctor said, and I take my medicine. Well, it's a good thing I went to an expert, and it's a good thing I listened to them, and it's a good thing I did something about it. So Pearl has a blind spot. Uh, it's, and I feel it's, it's a lack of, of, of diversity. Uh, Pearl has lost, you know, 80, 90 percent of its field of vision. Uh, it's lost people and their ideas, and even after it's been pointed out, Pearl cannot see that blind spot. Uh, and because we do not know what we do not know. And if we keep going like we've been going, we never will. Now fortunately, unlike my blind spot, that's uh, nerve damage, Pearl's blind spot could be fixed. Uh, but if and only if we do something about it. Because what I can tell you is if we do nothing about it, it'll just stay the same. So Pearl's blind spot looks like this. And let me tell you, we had machines rendering for hours on these. <laughs> um, uh, this, this is how much of the Pearl community that we, we can see. Uh, that you know, is on the RC channels of mailing and everything else. Um, these are the Pearl users that we know about. These are the Pearl users we don't know about. And this, this is kind of all the potential Pearl users that we could be, we could be hauling in. And we like to think that we are the Pearl community, that, that uh, irc.pearl.org and P5P and the Pearl.org mailing list and Yapsi and CPAN and Pearl Mongers and all that is the Pearl community, but we're not. And I'm just going to give us a name. I'm going to call us the Pearl.org community just so we don't keep saying community back and forth. Maybe I'm talking about the TV show. Um, now, who, who is the community and who owns the community? These are very good questions. And who, who gets to set the rules for the community, which is very, very important? Uh, the people who currently make up the Pearl.org community, do they, should they be setting the rules? Um, the people who already use Pearl, well, that's a little better for getting more people in. Uh, the people who you, you want to see using Pearl, it's almost there. Uh, the people who want to use Pearl should be the ones that we're building the community for. Uh, the community should be built not just for the people here at Yapsi, and not just for those on IRC, and not just for the people on the Pearl.org mailing list, and not just for the Pearl mongers. certainly should be built for all those people, but it should also be built for the people who use and want to use Pearl that we don't yet know about. How do you do that? Well. You start by getting people representing all the different types of people. Uh, blah, blah, blah. You start by getting people representing all the different types of people at the table as you can. You give them voice, power, and responsibility. You give them empowerment, uh, so they can't be ignored or forgotten about in the sea of white male, uh, thick-skinned developers. And then you all build from there together, just like being Picard with his bridge crew. You build a senior staff. Uh, representing all the important decisions, uh, all the important viewpoints on, on the ship. Uh, you have them present for all the important decisions and discussions, and you listen to them. So, a little segue. Uh, most of you know I maintain a bunch of really important CPAN modules, such as... <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, and and uh, you know things like other things like test more uh, that you, everybody uses for testing and test builder that all the other test modules are built on and make maker that handles most module installs. So if you're if you're using a mod if you're installing a module you're probably using my stuff. So let me ask you something. Why am I allowed to control how you write tests and install modules? And you might say that 
uh, it's because I'm doing good work. Well, that's not really, well, that's not really true. Uh, <laughs> but that's not why. Uh, and it's not because I'm the best person for the job. It's not because you all decide, it's not because you all decided I'm the best person for the job. Uh, it's not because you think I should take care of it. So 10 years ago, I led a drive to build a better testing system and, and uh, grab the namespaces for a test more and test builder along with Chromatic and a bunch of other people. Um, and 10 years ago, I led fixing up MakeMaker and shoved it onto CPAN and got the namespaces. Um, and so 10 years ago, I took over some areas that were languishing and did some things with merit. 10 years later, why am I still controlling how you write tests and install modules? And there's one and only one real reason. I own the namespaces. And nobody can take them away from me at least not on the current system. So 10 years ago, I did some work of merit, and now I have total control. <laughs> Benevolent-ish Benevolent dictatorship. Uh, not meritocracy, but dictatorship. And when I'm done with them, I'll hand them off to somebody I trust, which now becomes inheritance. And the government of inherited dictatorship is an aristocracy. Most of Pro works this way. Pro has become an aristocracy, not a meritocracy. Now, there are some projects that buck the trend, uh, and the system, but the system continues to encourage aristocracy and, and dictatorship. Um, you can do some homesteading on the edges, but more and more and more, the center of Pro development is an aristocracy. And aristocracies are very resistant to change. Uh, dictators have blind spots. If the dictator has a blind spot, the whole project has a blind spot. If the dictator hands off the project to somebody of their choosing, the successor will likely have the same blind spot. And this is part of why we are so homogenous, the aristocracy. Year after year, it becomes harder and harder to break in to the core, and the core gets larger and larger. And I don't just mean the core, you know, Perl, I mean all the big CPAN modules. Uh, it gets harder to break in and affect real change. So we need more Picards. Uh, Kirk, Kirk is overworked and at times a bit paranoid and, uh, and narrow-minded. Picard, he has time to blow in the whistle. <laughs> Maybe play some space squash. Picard has a carefully crafted senior staff. <laughs> and they make up all the different stakeholders on a Federation starship. Uh, defense, science, engineering, medical, social, discipline, uh, even the teachers, the, the parents, the families, and so on and so forth. Each of these represent a different viewpoint, a way of thinking, and a set of ideas. Uh, they have not just a voice, but they also have power and responsibility, and importantly, respect, the respect of Picard on the enterprise. They are empowered. Uh, and when the decision can be made, none of them can be ignored or forgotten, because they're all right there, represented on the bridge in the crisis. So Perl open source in general is made up of Kirks. And this is, I believe, the root of our problem. Uh, this is why we find it so hard to gather and maintain diversity and ideas. It doesn't do any good to make an effort to think about diversity today if the people in power don't really get it and are going to forget about them tomorrow. If they're just going to go back to optimizing it for themselves and their friends. It's like letting carnivores do the meal planning for vegetarians. Oh boy, another raw veggie blotter. <laughs> or letting car drivers design bike lanes. <laughs> so nobody eats the boring veggies. <laughs> nobody, nobody eats the boring veggies. Nobody rides in the dangerous bike lanes that go nowhere useful. You might wind up concluding there are no vegetarians, uh, there are no cyclists, why are we putting in the effort? And that's because it's not, if you build it, they will come. It's if you build it for the people and maintain it, it will come. They will come. So I became really convinced of this by a conference in my town called Open Source Bridge. Shameless plug. This is my, it's, it's still tickets available. <laughs> uh, um, this is my, my favorite conference. Uh, uh, OS Bridge came about in part because they were sick of how open source conferences are run. Um, open Source Bridge is technology agnostic. Uh, they, it's not so much about how you do it as what you're doing, what you're doing with it. Nobody cares if you're optimizing your Postgres database. They care about what you're putting into it. 
Um, OS Bridge is explicitly about having all the people involved in open source, uh, not just developers. Uh, users, admins, businesses, institutions, designers, journalists, newbies, oldbies, whatever. Uh, the talk proposals are all public and they're open to community comment and anybody can apply to be on the talk selection committee. Um, OS Bridge has 25% women speakers. Uh, and I was told uh, LinuxConf Australia hit 25% this year. Um, uh, men and women speak at the same time. Uh, it's, you know, amazing. Uh, you know, women appear everywhere. Uh, and it's really no big thing. And they solved this. They solved reams of typical open source conference problems with a fairly simple trick. Equity at the top. When they set up the conference committee, they made sure that it was made up of different kinds of people, different genders and races and viewpoints and languages and jobs and interests and concerns, all part of open source. They all had responsibility and they had power and they had voice. Um, and they all made sure that they were all right there from the start and they all made sure that when things were getting set up, everybody was being taken into account because they were all right there with their voice and their power. Um, right from the beginning to the end. And this isn't to say it wasn't hard and tricky work and dedicated, but it worked and it continues to work. I think they're on year three. Um, so instead of building a broken system dominated by a single set of concerns and then trying to fix it later, And having a big fight about it when people are upset because you didn't think about them or your fixes stink or and winding up with something half-assed and we know how frustrating we know how frustrating this is in a, in a software project right trying to turn the ship after it's been designed um, they designed it right from the start and like the best designs you don't even know it was designed that way uh, it just all works and it flows um, beautifully from equity at the top and the rest of it works itself out uh, there's a, a reference, a reference at the end, uh, if you want to read more about this, open source citizenship um, uh, at the end of it. So you might be thinking, a lot of people say, right, okay, that's a conference. Um, are there any software projects that work that way? And the answer is yes, quite a bit. Uh, the Apache Software Foundation, not just a web server. Uh, Apache has over 100 projects of all different types and different languages, um, most of which started as Kirks all of which are now Picards. Uh, they will not allow a Kirk. Um, so we're very lucky to have uh, Noreen Plunkett here, Executive Vice President of the Apache Software Foundation, and uh, she's going to give a couple talks about how they do it, so we can get to see another way to do it. Um, so she's giving one called, uh, there's more than one way to run a project, the Apache way, and that's at 11 o'clock in pile 325, and I kind of recommend that as a follow-up to this, if you're interested. Uh, and then tomorrow, she's giving a Q&A called Becoming a Better Benevolent Dictator, um, uh, again at 11 o'clock in the Lowell Dining Room. And if you want to hear about another way to do it, go to her talks, uh, because the Apache Foundation is nothing to be slouched at. Uh, find out what you don't know you don't know, learn a new way to do it, and uh, fix your blind spot. Now, I'll admit it, I'm a Kirk. But I want to be a Picard. I, but I can't just shave my head and call it all good. Uh, so I'm going to be doing some work in the future to uh, change how my CPEN modules are run. Uh, and I'm gonna be, so one of the things I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be writing down, writing down my policies and procedures, which basically are generally just in my head, uh, so that people know where they are, new people know where they are, uh, um, existing people know where they are and they can be discussed, they can be changed, they can be followed and so on and so forth. It's not just rule by man, it's rule by law. Um, I'm going to move towards a consensus driven uh, approach to accepting patches, which basically means, um, well basically what it means is I don't dominate every decision. Uh, and Noreen will talk more about what consensus is and how it works. It's not voting. Um, and uh, and it keeps, my, it keeps my blind spots from dominating. Um, I will try and have a, I'll have a public roadmap of where the project is going, uh, written down so that the community knows where things are going and they can have some say in the matter. Right now, all in my head. Um, it's going to be awkward. 
first season's always awkward. Uh, but that's how you learn by doing and by failing and by trying again. Um, so who, who can be a Picard here? Um, you know, it sounds like I'm talking about do it from the top uh, and that means must mean like, you know, P5P and all that. No. Pearl is interesting in that we have uh, 21,000 <coughs> CPAN distributions, something like that. Um, so that's 21,000 potential Picards. 21,000? No, 5,000 5, 5, authors. It's 5,000 potential, potential Picards just from CPAN alone, each with their own project. Uh, how many people here have a CPAN, have a module on CPAN? Yeah, okay. You can all, pray, you can all try and be a Picard. Uh, if any, you control a mailing list or um, Promongers group or an IRC channel. Uh, the more Picards we have, the more comfortable we'll be with Picards and the more Picards we'll have. What else can you do? Uh, well, if you see something, uh, you can say something. If you see an incident, if you see uh, um, something that should be taken care of, um, say something, but say it privately, both to the person at fault, uh, to let them know that what they did is not okay, um, but also to the moderator to uh, ask them to do their job, because we do not moderate anywhere near enough. Uh, why not publicly? Well, it just tends to fan the flames. We just get into flame wars, and the poor, poor person who had the incident winds up in the middle of this fur ball, um, and then they just leave because, or they don't talk about it anymore. Um, what else can you do? Well, you can be a mentor for somebody who isn't like you. Uh, different, different job, different gender, different language, different way of thinking, something, just something different. Um, maybe they're just really young, maybe they're really old, whatever. Uh, bring them into Pearl, stick up for them, shepherd them through, you know, teach them all the secret handshakes and everything else, uh, and kind of actively change the way, the way what our community is made up of. Um, what else? Uh, you can think about it. You can talk about it. You can blog about it. Uh, part of the reason I'm doing this keynote is to bust open the topic. Uh, so guys, you're allowed to talk about diversity. And, and gals, help the guys. I had a lot of help from a lot of women uh, in making this talk. It's hard. Uh, and um, help the guys that are willing to speak, check their work, back them up. Uh, so, Noreen has told me she's having a much more enjoyable conference knowing she doesn't have to give the unicorn talk. <laughs> the unicorn talk being, so you're a woman in open source, why don't you talk about that? Well, she wants to talk about something else. So, I'm giving it. Uh, I know a lot of you have things to say on this topic. Uh, there's so much more to cover, there's so much more to talk about. There's so many people who are so much better at this than I could be here. Um, don't be afraid to include topics in this talk, uh, uh, topics like this in your talks. Keep the conversation going, because I'm not going to solve this in 45 minutes. I'm amazingly on time, though. Um, <laughs> so if so, I, I want to. This is the last thing. So if, if you've tuned out uh, up to this point, just kind of wake up. This is all the content you need to hear. Um, if you're if after all this you're still unconvinced, or you tuned out, or you don't care, or you're on the fence, or whatever. This is all that I ask of you. Just one thing. When somebody reports an incident, or when somebody suggests running a project differently, or when somebody wants to talk about social oversight, or community issues, or a code of conduct, or something else, here's what I want you to do. If you do nothing else, I hope you will do more. But if you do nothing else, do this one thing for me. Shut up. Now. I want to elaborate on that. <laughs> so the other pro motto is try it. And a corollary, corollary to the other pro motto is let somebody else try it. So when, somebody, when somebody has a new idea, <clears throat> particularly if that person is new to the community, uh, it's very easy to overwhelm them with nitpicks and why the idea won't work. And this is known as stop energy. Uh, when it comes to social ideas, we have lots and lots and lots of people who want to nitpick. Uh, we have lots of concerns, lots of FUD, you know, it's just something we're not used to. Um, who want to say why it won't work, or why they're uncomfortable about it, and so on and so forth. We have a very homogenous community of socially passive know-it-alls. 
we overwhelm most attempts at social change with stop energy. And so what I'm asking the people in this room to do is just don't do that. Think and stop. If you don't say that we can't change things, uh, don't say it's futile, don't say the sky will fall, that everybody will leave, don't uh, tell somebody if they don't like it, they can go make their own project instead. Um, don't tell, uh, don't quibble over definitions and semantics. Um, don't tell people they should just deal with it. Uh, just let somebody else try it. Um, if you must comment, do it on your own blog or a different thread or, or whatever. Don't hijack their, their energy. Um, let them have their spaces succeed or fail. And if you have concerns, maybe try working with them instead of stopping them at the start. Because uh, we've been doing it the same way for 20 years. Let somebody else try it another way and see what happens. Uh, it might just work. There might just be more than one way to do it. Uh, but we'll never know unless we try. And uh, so what I ask is please, please honor the other pro motto and please let someone else try it. Otherwise, we're just going to have the same generation over again. But this time, it's going to look a bit awkward. <laughs> er. <laughs> so we've had so many Kirks for so long. It's, let's see what happens when we get some, some Picards. And then maybe we can have a Cisco and maybe a Janeway. Uh, and then hopefully, once we reach that point, nobody will have to give this talk again. So thank you. Um, so I, like I said, I had, I, these are not fresh ideas. Um, I want to reiterate that uh, Noreen is having her talks, uh, there's more than one way to run a project, uh, at 11 in Pile 325. She's doing Becoming a Better, Better Benevolent Dictator, which is basically a Q&A. If you are a benevolent dictator and want to know how to run your project differently, she will talk about that. Uh, there's a, um, oh, I don't have the URL up here. There's a, uh, she has a URL for um, questions that you might want to have a answered at the q and I presume it's in the schedule. What's that? Bitly slash nation building. Bitly slash nation building. All, all lowercase, no spaces? Yeah, yeah. bitly slash nation building. Uh, and for further reading, I've basically uh, put together notes and, and stuff. Uh, you can get them. It's a little low, sorry. Bitly slash uh, yapsy2012 underscore keynote. Um, and that contains a lot of the references here, the numbers that I've been using, um, things like Audrey Oshbright's uh, open source citizenship, um, the, the, the merit, various merit, the meritocracies, broken arguments, um, uh, a fantastic one called um, Why Biology Demonstrates Why There Are No Women in Open Source. Hint, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> so on and so forth. OK, uh, has everybody uh, got time to get those things? Great, thank you so much. I'm going to collapse now. <laughs> <laughs>